So this next video is the 10 creepiest mysteries ever solved by the internet. And before we get into it, did y'all know that one of the biggest mysteries of life for human beings living on this planet is death? It's crazy, right? Let's check this out. The internet can be a very strange place. While it seemingly is an endless source of information on just about any subject someone can think of, it also has a darker side where people can often be rather nasty to each other. Luckily, some internet users do their best to help others, a good example of this being the internet sleuths who attempt to solve cold missing person cases or crimes where the culprit managed to get away before being identified. Number 10, the case of the disappearance of a 63-year-old woman called Susan Rainwater, who hailed from the Eatonville area in Washington, has been solved thanks to internet sleuths. Susan's husband of 30 years later told a media outlet that she would wake him up with a kiss and a cup of coffee every morning, and her daughter stated that Susan told her that she loved her every day. On the 9th of August, 2018, Susan woke her husband up as normal and told him that she was going out for a ride on her bike and that she would be back in about half an hour. But soon he started to worry when she didn't come home as planned, and he got in his car to go look for her. His worst fears were realized when he noticed something by the side of the road, and when he approached, he realized it was Susan's bike. He got out and searched the area and found her lying some distance away, and to his shock, she was deceased. The Washington State Patrol responded to the scene, and quickly determined that she'd been struck by a car, but the driver had fled, and the only piece of information they had was a black piece of plastic that had broken off the car when the collision occurred. One of the responding troopers uploaded a photo of the item to Twitter, asking members of the public if they could identify what type of vehicle it belonged to. Investigators didn't hold out much hope that anyone would recognize it, but felt that it was worth a try. The following day, a Reddit user reposted the photo to the what is this thing subreddit and surprisingly they got a response from someone who thought that they recognized it a user called jeff's nuts who was a vehicle inspector replied that the piece of plastic belonged to a late 80s chevrolet ck pickup truck and as proof he provided a photo of his own the trooper who uploaded the photo contacted investigators in susan's case and relayed the information she had gathered they then looked at surveillance footage of the area and identified a man named Jeremy Simon as the owner of an identical truck. When his truck was checked, it was found to be missing the exact piece that was found at the scene of the accident, and he was taken into custody. He was charged with vehicular manslaughter, leaving the scene of a fatal accident and possession of a controlled substance. He explained that he was a carpenter and at the time was working long hours. On that morning, he was heading home when he fell asleep at the wheel and struck something. At first, he thought he'd hit a mailbox, but when he looked in his rearview mirror, he saw a bicycle lying in the road. He immediately panicked and decided to flee. At his trial, he stated that he didn't mean to hurt anyone and that he'd been seeking help for his substance abuse problem. Simon was sentenced to 53 and a half months behind bars, but since he would be part of a drug offender sentencing alternative, he would only serve half that. Susan's family wasn't happy about this outcome. I was about to say like, bro, I get it. Everybody makes mistakes, but that family's loved one isn't never coming back. That's, <clears throat> bro, like, it, oh, it makes you question the judicial system a lot, man. A lot, a lot, a lot. Like, bro, whoa. But was satisfied that the culprit had been caught and could now receive the help he needed. Her daughter was heard telling Simon at his trial to do better and to live a better life. Number nine, gang violence has claimed thousands of lives over the decades, many of which were innocent bystanders who simply got caught in the crossfire. The case involving 24-year-old Crystal Theobald is one of these tragic incidents that could have been prevented since her life was ended as a result of mistaken identity. Crystal and her family lived in Arlanza, California, and in February of 2006, her brother Robert drove away from the family's home in his light-colored SUV. He then noticed a white Ford Expedition driving around the neighborhood, and as soon as its driver spotted Robert, they started following him. He decided to try and get away, but as he sped up, the expedition followed suit. 
A chase ensued, but after a few minutes of trying to get away, he finally lost the SUV. Robert didn't know who the people in the other car were, and for his own safety, he wasn't planning on finding out. He made it to his daughter's mother's house and was thankful to be safe. But unbeknownst to Robert, the white explorer was still driving around the area when Crystal arrived at an intersection with her boyfriend and other brother, Justin, in the car with her. Her mother, Belinda, was following in her own car and stopped at the same intersection when a man got out of a white expedition, walked up to Crystal's car, produced a firearm, and started firing at her SUV, which was similar in color to Robert's. Crystal lost her life in the incident, and her boyfriend was wounded. Belinda noticed the entire incident but was powerless to do anything. The man then got back in his vehicle and fled the scene. During the investigation, it came to light that members of a gang called 5150 had been cruising around the area looking for someone in a similar vehicle who performed a hit on the gang earlier that day. They mistook Robert's and Crystal's cars for the vehicle in question, and without making sure of who was in the car, decided to open fire. Belinda was determined to find the gangsters responsible for ending her daughter's life, and together with Crystal's cousin, Jamie, she set up two fake MySpace accounts, one of which had a photo of Crystal, but not her name. Before long, she started speaking to William Jokes Satello, a member of the 5150s, and she managed to get him to admit that he was the driver and the owner of the expedition. She then forwarded this information to investigators, and Satello was brought in to be questioned. Satello revealed that a man named Julio Heredia was the one who had fired at Crystal's car. After Sotelo was released, he fled to Mexico and wasn't seen again for about 10 years. Two brothers, William and Manuel Lemos, were later identified as also being in the car during the crime, and they later testified against Heredia. He was eventually sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, with an added 95 years to life and 43 years tacked on. Sotelo was later apprehended after Belinda received an anonymous tip on his whereabouts, and he was sentenced to 22 years behind bars. The Lemus brothers avoided prosecution since they decided to testify against their fellow gang members. Like, that's scary. That, that whole scenario there is scary because you never know. You, there's no way to ever prevent that because you don't know you were driving around in a familiar car that they were looking for. That, that's one of them things where it's like, you look up and you're just like, well, it was that person's time. It had to be that person's time to go. Because you cannot prevent that. And then it was sheer guilt, probably, or them turning on that other member uh, or something like that in order for them to come forward like that. And that was pretty clever of, of I think it was the mom, to befriend them like that. Like, I, I, that, was, that was very, very clever of her. Number 8. On the 29th of October, 2006, two men were target shooting in the woods of Kilgore, Texas, when they noticed a fire deeper into the woods. They decided to investigate but could never have prepared themselves for what they found when they reached the fire. The fire had been started intentionally, since wood had been piled up and set alight using gasoline, which was evident from the gas can lid that was lying nearby. But inside the fire, they spotted a body and immediately notified the authorities. It was obvious to investigators that someone was trying to dispose of evidence after ending the woman's life, but they had no idea who she was. It was determined that she was likely in her early 20s, and when items of clothing that were found at the scene were searched, they found about $40 in one of her jean pockets. They also found a purple sweater, but neither of these items was useful in determining her identity. Whoever the culprit was, they had started the fire just minutes before the two men came across it, and the hunt was on to find them. But with very few clues to follow, the case soon went cold. It was believed that the woman lost her life at around 10 a.m. the previous day. She was estimated to have weighed around 110 pounds, stood around 5 foot 4, and thanks to her perfect teeth was thought to have come from a middle-class family. Biological material was also found at the scene and was preserved in hopes that it could identify the culprit. Residents in the area told investigators that they had seen several suspicious people in the area that day, but couldn't identify anyone specifically. The woman's DNA was entered into several different databases, but returned no positive results. Facial reconstruction was performed, giving investigators an idea of what she looked like, 
but they were no closer to identifying her or capturing her attacker. But then the case caught the attention of an internet sleuth named Kevin Lord, who'd spent a lot of time online trying to solve cases where unidentified victims remained unidentified. He got in touch with one of the investigators in the case, Lieutenant Eddie Hope, and they then contacted the DNA Doe Project, which aids in identifying unknown victims of crimes. They then set up a crowdfunding campaign and managed to raise enough money for the woman who is now being called Lavender Doe's DNA to be analyzed once again. From there, they were able to create a family tree and got in contact with some of her distant relatives. As a result, she was finally identified as Dana Lynn Todd and her family was notified. A man named Joseph Wayne Burnett eventually confessed to attacking Dana and ending her life. He also confessed to ending the life of his former girlfriend, Felicia Pearson, in 2018. He told investigators that he met Dana when he was at a Walmart. She was selling magazine subscriptions, and he managed to convince her to get into his car. He claims that she stole some of his money while in his car, and he then decided to end her life. Dana's family struggled to come to terms with her passing, but was grateful that her case had finally been solved. Burnett pleaded guilty to both homicide charges, and he was sentenced to 100 years in prison. It may have taken 12 years, but thanks to internet sleuths working together with law enforcement, Dana was identified, and her attacker was brought to justice. You know, to hear some of these people's reasoning why they did the crime, oh, I, 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 she got in my car and she stole some of my stuff. So what did the previous girl that you killed, did, what did she do? She put bubble gum on you? She stuck some gum to your shirt or something and, and it was sticky and never came out? It was your favorite shirt? Like, come on, are you serious? She stole some? Cool. Get her out your vehicle, call the police, file a report, do all You had to end her life like that and then burn her? Come on, bro. I, I don't believe none of that. Number seven, the disappearance of Linda Pagano, who hailed from Akron, Ohio, is one that has baffled her family and investigators since 1974. But thanks to a keen internet sleuth, investigators were finally able to make some headway. The case started on the 1st of September of that year, when Linda attended a concert. But when she got home later than she was supposed to, it caused some friction in the family's home on Carnegie Avenue. She and her stepfather got into a heated argument that resulted in him telling her to leave the house, which she then did while still angry. It was a decision that he would come to regret, as Linda never returned home and her fate remained unknown. During the investigation, her stepfather told investigators that she left the house on foot, but that he didn't know where she planned to go. Her brother Michael immediately had a bad feeling about her disappearance. He and other members of their family suspected that her life may have been ended, and that her stepfather may have been responsible but no evidence to support this theory was ever found. The resulting searches turned up no further clues, and no one came forward to report that they'd seen her after she walked away from the house. The case went cold, and Linda's mother passed away without ever finding out what happened to her. Her stepfather passed away in 1990, and Michael was certain that he would pass away one day without his sister being found, but thankfully, he was wrong. More than 40 years after she went missing, the case would see new life when a Reddit user with the username Call Me Ice took an interest in the case. She learned that on the 5th of February, 1975, five months after Linda disappeared, three boys were walking along the Rocky River in Strongsville when they came across skeletal remains and they immediately contacted the police. The scene was thoroughly searched, but no evidence was found to identify the deceased person. When an autopsy was performed, it was determined that the remains belonged to a woman in her late teens or early 20s, and that her life had been ended with a firearm. The case now became a homicide investigation, but there were no leads to follow. Years went by, and eventually decades passed without any new developments. No one claimed the remains, which were then buried in Highland Hills, and the deceased woman was given the moniker Strongsville Jane Doe. It seemed that the case would never be solved. But that was when the internet stepped in. Call Me Ice was browsing through old cemetery records when she stumbled across the details of Strongsville Jane Doe's burial. She then found the autopsy report and a photo of the remains, which was then used to create a facial reconstruction. The Doe's details were then added to the NamUs database, 
and she forwarded the details to the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office. In 2016, the Akron Police Department believed they'd found a match after they noticed some similarities between the Strongsville Jane Doe and Linda's case. The remains were exhumed and sent for DNA testing. The results showed that they belonged to Linda, and against all odds, she'd finally been found. Michael was overwhelmed by the news and had a chance to meet Call Me Ice, who turned out to be a woman named Christina Skates, and he was able to convey his gratitude that she had taken an interest in his sister's case. It just sucks they wasn't able to identify the killer. And I know a lot of y'all thinking like me, was it the stepdad? And he got off. He ended up dying before they figured out what happened to her, man. But even if he didn't do it, bro, that's one of the scariest things, fam. To tell your kid, get out. And then the next thing, even if it is your stepkid, and then the next thing they go missing and you never see him again, you got to live with that guilt of saying, what if, what if I'd have never told her to leave? How do you think her mom felt? <sighs> Number six, it isn't only members of the public who use the internet and social media to raise awareness and hopefully solve cases that have left investigators stumped. One case involving 24-year-old Mike Pimentel from Liberty Village in Toronto, Canada was solved thanks to a detective who decided to reach out to the public via Twitter, now known as X. On New Year's Day of 2012, Mike was leaving the Liberty Grand Banquet Hall at Exhibition Place after celebrating the arrival of the new year. But he somehow got separated from his group of friends and they were unable to find him. Later that morning, at around 3 a.m., someone stumbled across Mike near Liberty Street and realized that he'd been injured. The police were called and it was determined that Mike had been attacked with a sharpened blade. He was rushed to the hospital but sadly passed away soon after. The case had now turned from an assault investigation into a homicide case, and the police started hunting for clues. Footage from the night in question showed a man who they considered to be a person of interest, and images were released to the public along with an appeal for anyone who recognized him to come forward. They described the man as Caucasian in his mid-twenties, standing between 5'6 and 5'7 inches tall, with short hair and a slim build but no one came forward and the investigation ground to a halt until Detective Staff Sergeant Tam Bui decided to approach it from a different angle. He and his wife had been listening to a podcast called Serial, which discusses unsolved cold cases. He usually found these cases to be complicated and sometimes boring, but noted that the podcast summed all the details up nicely, which seemed to grab their audience's attention. He decided to use social media in the same way and started uploading information and photos from Mike's case to Twitter. First was a photo of a woman who was seen with a person of interest. A week later, he added more photos, this time of items found at the scene including a hair extension that had biological material on it, a pair of black high-heeled shoes, and a bunch of keys attached to a keychain of the Moroccan flag. He uploaded more information every Saturday and before long, social media users were hooked by the mystery. Tips and inquiries started flooding in, and eventually investigators got a break in the case, though they didn't disclose which of the tweets had resulted in the needed information. They discovered that the man they were looking for was 30-year-old Sean Poirier, who was then taken into custody. Poirier stated that he acted in self-defense during a street fight that had broken out between him and Mike, and he pleaded not guilty to a charge of second-degree murder. He says that he and the woman in the photos, his girlfriend, Sasha Harton, had been bar hopping, and when he stopped to relieve himself on a street corner, they were confronted by Mike, who Poirier claimed started screaming at them. He added that after Mike threw him to the ground, he grabbed his blade from Harton's purse and used it to fight back, resulting in Mike's injuries. Mike then simply turned and walked away from the fight. When asked why he didn't report the incident, Poirier stated that he had a criminal record and was worried that the man may have succumbed to his injuries. The trial resulted in a mistrial, and when a new trial was scheduled, Poirier was given a lesser charge of manslaughter to which he pleaded guilty. He was found guilty and sentenced to four years, four months, and ten days in jail. But since he'd already spent time in prison awaiting his trial, he only had one day left to serve. Number five, when a loved one passes away, those who mourn them often find solace in the possessions that they left behind, 
as it serves as a reminder of who they were and what they meant to those around them. This could take the form of jewelry, a vehicle they used to drive, or letters that they wrote to loved ones. But in the case involving a grandmother named Dorothy Holm, one of the possessions that she left behind after passing away from a brain tumor in 1996 left her family baffled for nearly two decades. In the weeks leading up to her passing, the tumor had rendered Dorothy unable to speak, and instead she had used index cards to write her thoughts down and to communicate with her family who was caring for her. After her passing, her children found these cards and discovered that one stood out among the rest. The card didn't have complete sentences like the rest, but instead contained some kind of code. Her granddaughter, Jana, and her cousins were still young at the time, but they did their best to decipher the strange writing, only to come up short. The writing was strange as it contained backwards commas and breaks that seemingly had no functions, and they were forced to admit defeat. The card was put away in a safe place and remained there for years until Jana's father happened upon it again years later. Jana was reminded of the code, and she decided to have another attempt at deciphering it. She joined a site called Metafilter, to which she posted the following, saying, quote, My grandmother was alive from 1927 to 1996 and lived in Minnesota. Her three children were born in the 50s, and most music in the house would have played in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. I don't have any of her other index cards, but my aunts may have some. None of them match each other, and the card does not include anything that her husband recognized. There are no family member initials, etc. The letters Z, X, and Q never appear. Y only appears in the last line. Jana was of the opinion that Dorothy had written the letters down so that she could remember the lyrics to her favorite songs, but she was unable to match them to any songs that she knew her grandmother listened to regularly. As soon as the image was uploaded to the site, Users, known as Mephites, took an interest, and the race was on to see who could crack the code first. The mystery of the strange writing had bothered the family for 18 years, but it took internet users just 13 minutes to arrive at the correct answer. One user mentioned the first few letters on the card, which were O-F-W-A-I-H-H-B-T-N, and asked whether Dorothy was a religious woman. Jana replied that she was, and that's when the mystery was finally solved. The users revealed that the letters were the first line in the Lord's Prayer, reading, quote, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The mystery was then finally solved, and Jana was delighted to learn that Dorothy used the cards as a type of cheat sheet to remember the Lord's Prayer up until her final days. See, stuff like this is why you'll never get rid of the internet. I don't care how much you hate it. I don't care how much it makes you mad. I don't care how much you hate the people that get on there and do obscene things and different things that just tick you off. There's good pockets of the internet, bro. And solving these mysteries and crimes and doing different things like this for loved ones, bro, you'll never get rid of it. You'll never get it. We're never going back to a day without the internet, bro. Like it or love it, it's here to stay, fam. And for these reasons like this and stuff like this, bro, I'm, I'm here for it. Number four, websleuths.com is a well-known site on which members of the community try to solve missing person cases and other crimes that have gone unsolved, some for decades. And they've seen a lot of success over the years. They were responsible for solving the mystery of a missing woman named Tammy Jo Alexander. Tammy grew up living with her mother and stepfather, but eventually left to live with her grandmother after her mother became addicted to medication that had been prescribed to her, causing her to have violent outbursts. In the years that followed, her mother started working as a waitress at a truck stop, and when Tammy was in her teenage years, she returned to Brooksville, Florida to live with her mother, but her time there was far from pleasant. She was in the habit of running away from home at times and was known to hitchhike as far as California, usually with one of her friends. On most occasions, she would contact her family once there, and they would then buy airline tickets for the girls to return to Florida. In 1979, she ran away once again and was never seen or heard from again. Her family had no idea where she had gone, and her mother would eventually pass away at the age of 56 without ever finding out what had happened to her. In November of that year, a farmer was walking alone on one of his cornfields next to the Genesee River in Caledonia 
when he spotted a red piece of clothing, thinking that he may have come across a hunter who was trespassing on his property. He went to investigate, but was shocked to find the body of a young woman. He called the police who rushed to the scene and found that her life had been ended with a firearm. Her pockets had been turned out and hence it was impossible to identify her. So she was given the nicknames Caledonia Doe and Cali Doe. Unfortunately, it had been raining heavily in the area and much of the evidence such as DNA that may have been left at the scene had been washed away. Carl Koppelman, a moderator for the Web Sleuths website, came across the case of Cali Doe and managed to complete a facial reconstruction, giving members of the website a good idea of what she would have looked like when she was alive. Then, in 2014, he stumbled across the case of Tammy's disappearance, and he immediately knew that she was the woman who was found in Caledonia. He contacted the authorities and informed them about what he had found. Until she was identified, the remaining members of her family assumed that Tammy had run away to start a new life somewhere else since she could no longer stand living with her mother. It was then determined that she'd traveled to the New York State Thruway, likely with someone who'd picked her up while hitchhiking. They were sure of this since investigators found a keychain with her remains, which was sold at vending machines along that route at the time. Over the years, more than 10,000 leads were followed, but they never resulted in Tammy being found. Strangely, Tammy's mother never reported her as missing, likely because she was in the habit of running away. Though if she had done so, the case may have been solved much sooner. A composite sketch was compiled of a man who was seen with Tammy at the diner. A waitress who worked there gave a description and the sketch was released to the public, but her attacker has never been identified. I just gotta say, bro, I, I never, ever could understand how somebody could hitchhike. I just can't understand that, bro. That's like, that's like rolling the dice with your life. And eventually you're going to crap out. And hitchhiking from Florida to California, that's diabolical. That's, that's just, that's diabolical. There's no other way to put it, bro. But yeah, I never understood hitchhiking. Can never grasp it. Number three, Tara Grinstead grew up in Hawkinsville, Georgia with her best friend, Maria Woods. Maria says that Tara had the biggest smile she'd ever seen and had the ability to make anyone feel better when they were going through a tough time. In 2005, she was attending night school since she wanted to obtain a specialist degree, which would help her achieve her dream of working in education, specifically as a school administrator or principal. But before this, she managed to obtain scholarship money by competing in beauty pageants. And in 1999, she won the Miss Tifton pageant, which afforded her the chance to compete in the Miss Georgia competition, which was also held that year. Although she didn't win, she achieved her goal of making it that far. When she eventually retired from these competitions, she mentored other pageant hopefuls, teaching them how to conduct themselves during interviews, how to do their makeup, and so forth. She was in a relationship with an army ranger called Marcus Harper for six years. But since he spent a lot of time out of the country, they eventually split up and the breakup left her distraught. By this time, she was 30 years old and had started working as a history teacher at Irwin County High School and was the coach of the school's cheerleading squad. Her life was following the path that she had intended it to, but in October of 2005, everything changed. On Monday, the 24th of October of that year, she failed to show up for her classes, something that was very out of character. The school contacted her friends and a neighbor, but no one had seen her and the police were called. They traveled to Tara's house and managed to make their way inside. There was no sign of her, but they found that her bed hadn't been made and that her bedside lamp had somehow been smashed. The surrounding area was searched and in the house's front yard, they found a single latex glove. While investigators initially believed that she'd left the area of her own free will, the discovery of the glove suggested that something more sinister had taken place. DNA found on the glove was sent to be analyzed and when the results came back, they showed that Tara's DNA was present along with that of an unknown man. The man's DNA didn't match anyone in the database, and with no further leads, the case went cold. It caught the attention of Payne Lindsay, the host of the Up and Vanished podcast, which has a following of millions of people. He often spoke about Tara's case, raising awareness about all the facts and clues that were found. His vested interest in the case drew the attention of Maurice Godwin, a private investigator who'd been working on the case for over a decade at the request of Tara's family. He contacted Payne, 
and together they started looking at the case again, starting from the very beginning. They looked at new leads that had come in thanks to the podcast. While all of the details have not been released, Georgia police were able to identify a suspect in the case and announced that a man named Ryan Duke had been taken into custody. It was discovered that he was one of Tara's former students, and a week later, a friend of his, Bo Dukes, was also arrested. It was then revealed that Ryan Dukes had broken into Tara's home, and when he was discovered, he ended her life. He then confessed to Duke, who has no relation to him, and together they disposed of her body on a nearby farm. The attention garnered by the podcast had prompted Brooke Sheridan, Duke's girlfriend, to contact the police, and she revealed that he'd confessed to her that he was the culprit. Agent J.T. Ricketson from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation stated that the media and the podcast were instrumental in bringing the two men to justice. Duke was acquitted of ending Tara's life, but was ordered to spend 10 years in prison for hiding her body. Number two, it must be a harrowing experience for the families of a missing person to wonder for years on end what happened to them. And in some cases, they never receive the answers that they're so desperately looking for. One such case started on the 29th of December, 2013, when 59-year-old Navy veteran Donnie Irwin woke his wife up at around 6 a.m. and asked her for a gift card that they had received. He told her that he wanted to use it to buy cigarettes from a gas station about five miles from their house in Camdenton, Missouri. She got up, gave him the card, and since it was early, went back to sleep. When she woke up later, she was surprised to find that Donnie wasn't home, which she found strange since the gas station was close to the house. She contacted the police and one of her friends, Mindy Sales, and Donnie was reported as missing. Investigators scoured through CCTV footage of the area, but he was never seen on the route to the gas station, and it was believed he never made it that far. No further clues were found, and it was suggested that he may have ended up in one of the Ozarks lakes. Teams of divers hired by Donnie's family periodically searched the waters for over four years, but to no avail, as no sign of him was found. It was noted that Donnie suffered from PTSD and that he had other mental health issues, but it wasn't known whether this played a part in his disappearance. Then in 2022, the case caught the attention of a YouTuber named James Hinkle, who had a history as a firefighter, rescue scuba diver, and drone operator. Since Donnie's disappearance had taken place close to his home, he decided to investigate it and he traveled to the Ozarks with his kayak, diving equipment, and a drone. He searched through lakes, drove around back roads, and even dove into flooded quarries for several months, uploading his efforts to his YouTube channel. Then in December of 2023, James was flying his drone above a pond near Donnie's home when he spotted the silhouette of a car beneath the water. He contacted the police who recovered the car, a Hyundai Elantra, and the remains that it contained. They realized amongst the remains, there was an artificial hip that matched Donnie's, and it was confirmed that Donnie's disappearance had been solved. His family was informed, and they stated that it was the best Christmas they'd ever had, as they finally knew what had happened to Donnie and now had a sense of closure. It isn't known how his car ended up in the pond, but investigators don't suspect foul play and believe it was likely due to Donnie losing control of his car. Hinkle stated that he plans to continue working on other missing person cases in Missouri, and that he was elated to have helped bring this decades-old mystery to a close. Number one, when a missing person case has been cold for many years, investigators often find themselves too busy with new cases to spend much time trying to solve them. And for decades, no progress is made. One such case involves Maureen Therese Sherman, a 47-year-old woman who disappeared from Miami on the 1st of May, 1985. Her family was very concerned for her well-being at the time, since she wasn't in the best state of mind, and had mentioned that she was contemplating driving her car into a canal near her home. On the day that she went missing, she got into a red Plymouth Reliant K station wagon and drove away from her home, never to be seen or heard from again. Her family reported her as missing, and a search was organized, but no clues were ever found, though her family did suspect that she'd followed through on the threats that she had made earlier. For the next four decades, Maureen's family wondered what had happened to her. No leads were ever found, no witnesses came forward to report that she'd been spotted, and subsequent searches were unsuccessful in locating her. Then, in January of 2024, 
two volunteer dive teams called Sunshine State Sonar and Adventures with Purpose decided to look into the case. Both teams have YouTube channels to which they upload similar cases where they search waterways, lakes, ponds, and rivers for people who have gone missing and were never located. Given that as many as 90,000 people who are reported missing every year in the US are never found, their mission is undoubtedly a noble one, and they've seen a lot of success in the past. Some of the cases that have been solved with the help of Sunshine State Sonar include the disappearance of Bernie Novick, who was found in 2024, Eduardo Guatirol, who was missing for six years before being found, Kareem Tisdale, who was found after being missing for 19 years, and Karen Moore, who disappeared 22 years ago, among many others. As for Adventures with Purpose, they were instrumental in solving the case of Kylie Rodney, who disappeared in 2022, Diedrich Smith, who disappeared in October of 2006, Vietnam veteran Thomas Thornton, who went missing in Shelby County in March of 2021, and Carrie Mae Parker, who disappeared in her Buick in 1991, to name but a few. On the 5th of January, 2024, the two teams of volunteers decided to search a canal near Marine's house. And after just six hours of diving through the murky waters, they came across a car that resembled the Plymouth that she was driving. They noticed that the car's windows were still down, and so assumed that whoever was driving would still be inside. They contacted the police, who then extracted the vehicle from the canal, and they could now start the process of identifying the remains that were found inside. Thanks to part of the car's license plate and the remains within the car, it was confirmed that Maureen had finally been found, and her family was able to later to rest as they had hoped to do for the last 40 years since she disappeared. That same weekend, the two teams were able to find another three people who had disappeared, and eventually located five missing people in a span of just six days. They continue with their mission and hope to bring closure to many more families in the years to come.